thank you very much. That's very kind, and uh, it is good to be here. Uh, my name is Chuck. I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I was a little worried. I, I'm a bit rusty at giving uh, speeches. I feel a little bit like the Toronto Maple Leafs. I haven't been on the job for quite a while. Come on, we're a family now, we're a family. <laughs> you know, and I, I, what I thought of, John, was how soon people forget. You know, I didn't run in the last federal election, and, uh, but I came back to Ottawa. I thought, you know, well, that'll be okay. I jumped into, I, I walked down the hall, I bumped into John Iveson. And John says, I know you. I know you, he says, I know, don't tell me I know you. You're Mark's dad, he says to me. He's good, my son's a member of parliament. Anyway, it's a, anyway, good to be back. Thanks, John, for the warm welcome. And it's good to be back to part of the Manning Networking Conference with people like you who make up the backbone of the conservative movement. And although, you know, I'm never quite sure about holding this conference in Ottawa. My, the people back home remind me that Ottawa is five square kilometers surrounded by reality. <laughs> and you may wonder if that's true or not, but just, just think of it this way. For example, there's one housekeeping item that we should deal with up front. If any of you need to leave during the middle of my speech, don't worry, the rest of us will understand. We'll just assume you're from Winnipeg and you buy your underwear from the same dealer as Pat Martin. <laughs> it is uh, unreal here. In all seriousness, you know, it's been quite a conference already. All sorts of juicy policy discussions. There's been provocative strategies, reports from ministers and premiers. Uh, there's a room filled with fiscal conservatives and social conservatives and green conservatives and well, just about any kind of conservative you want is here uh, during this movement discussion. And there are all sorts of people looking at ways to be more effective in bringing conservative values and principles to bear on the politics and governance of our cities, provinces, and country. And it takes, it does take all kinds of conservative-minded uh, people to make up a crowd like this, and no one sums it up better than Preston Manning, who did so from this stage last year, and he did it like this. This is who's involved. The conservative movement it is the extended conservative family which nurtures and supports its members. The parties run the family business, which is winning elections and governing. The movement has a broader, softer, relational side. It provides an honored place for the veterans of the political wars and a training base for the new recruits. And it provides a place of shelter when the political storm clouds burst and the electoral tides are unkind and a place from which to celebrate when the sun shines and conservatives live under the rainbow of political success. You know, and he did all of that without saying the word reform. Not once, did say it once. Very good, Preston. Anyway, bringing all the component parts of the movement together at this conference is part of the Manning Center's contribution to building and, and strengthening what we call the Big Blue Tent. And uh, this year we went so far, as you, as you know, to actually build a Big Blue Tent out in the foyer, and I hope you've been able to spend a little bit of time in there to find out what the Manning Center does and also to reflect on some of our historic achievements and, and uh, also do a little networking of your own. <coughs> And I don't, uh, I don't tell anyone, I don't think we should tell anyone, even if this is being broadcast, we won't tell anyone outside this room, but I saw a few media folks in that big blue tent, and I, I know they will never write about cutbacks to the CBC the same way again. I did just a little bit of time in the big blue tent, guys, and you'll be just fine uh, from here on in. And our conference theme is, uh, is the way forward. It's no secret there's going to be a federal election this year, and we're moving closer to provincial elections in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and uh, likely even in Alberta. Our theme is a reminder that this is a time to move forward together, to be united by the things we have in common, and not divided over things that, in the end, don't really matter. And at the Manning Centre, when we're not busy organizing this conference, we're endeavouring to strengthen the knowledge, skills, ethics, and communications, leadership cap uh, capabilities and capacities of people in the movement. And uh, we're just like Sally Field. Remember Sally Field when she made that uh, Academy Award acceptance speech a few years ago? You know, we want you to like us, to really, really like us. And so if you would like us, please, on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, you'll be able to stay informed about all of our activities throughout the year. 
One of the conservative strengths in recent times have been, has been the ability to focus on principle, our principles on a limited number of priorities and to make the main thing the main thing. In other words, while it's important to have a plan on how to get elected, you need to know what it is you want to do once you have actually the honor of forming government. When I was a wet behind the ears uh, candidate back when, uh, Preston Manning would urge us to think about this. Think about why we wanted to the job before we got elected, because there's certainly no time to think about that after you're here. You want to be well grounded and well prepared before you get to parliament, before you get to a legislature. Uh, and uh, you know the the con the the, uh, the opposing view of that would be perhaps what Paul Martin did when he came to office, which he had dozens of number one priorities, but couldn't get much of it done because he was here, there, and everywhere, and the main thing wasn't the main thing. Conservatives know that the top of mind issues for Canadians uh, revolve around the economy. That's why so many of the major sessions here at MNC 2015 have been, been devoted to economic issues. Let's call it moving forward on the economy in order to emphasize ideas and proposals to strengthen the confidence of taxpayers, business people, entrepreneurs, workers and consumers across the country. This is the issue on which principled conservatives are and must be seen to be stronger than our competitors. Canada dealt with the 2008 financial meltdown more effectively under a conservative administration than any other G20 country in the world, including the United States. Year after year under a conservative administration, analysts say that our banking system is the best, not one of the best, the best in the entire world. Our tax levels are the lowest they have been in 50 years, and as has been mentioned, uh, I'll never forget when, uh, when Euro Money Magazine, I was in the House of Commons at the time, declared that then Finance Minister Jim Flaherty wasn't just one of the good guys, not a hail fellow well met, he was the best finance minister in the world. And we still miss Jim today. It was, uh, it was good in that session with the Premiers to hear some of our provincial leaders who are putting forward balanced budgets and fiscal restraint in the, in the window as the best defence against potential economic problems. From BC, my home province, we heard from Christy Clark that her government is on course for another balanced budget and, a, and the best AAA credit rating in the, in the country. And they didn't do it by frittering away some millennial's future or, or condemning them to the debt house. They did it by restraining the demands of public sector unions, by controlling government expenses, and by promoting and encouraging private sector initiatives. In Alberta, Premier Prentice has promised that despite falling oil revenue, his government has chosen to start their budget balancing efforts by rolling up their sleeves to get spending under control, which is why I like working with him in cabinet as well. And, the one, and, and of course, Premier Pulaski, who who, of Pazlowski, who uh, pledged to make development of natural resources a path forward for wealth creation. And citizens in uh, jurisdictions across the country can only dream to have the same priorities as the premiers that presented here. And, well, heck, in, in Ontario, they'd just be satisfied if someone would just quit trying to buy their votes with their own tax dollars. If, I wonder sometimes, you know, I just, I wonder, somebody mentioned this, uh, this isn't my line, but I, I, I'm going to steal it. It's, I wonder sometimes if Kathleen Wynne is using Grecian formula, and I'm not talking about a hair product, I'm talking about a tax, spend, and deficit program as a way to manage the economy, the new Grecian formula. We heard a strong message from uh, Minister Joe Oliver, who has picked up the baton from Mr. Flaherty and is moving us forward toward balanced budgets, lower taxes, and public expenditure restraint. And I might not be working uh, day to day here in Ottawa anymore, but I can say this from watching and listening to Joe Oliver, he believes that balancing the books is hard work and he does not believe, as do some leaders, that if you just think positive thoughts, the budget will magically balance itself. Not that a serious leader would say that. Speaking of Mr. Trudeau, um, his, approach, <laughs> his approach to balancing the budget during difficult times reminds me of a story we tell out west about the difference between range cattle and buffalo. The Liberals on the, on the economy are acting like cattle. When a storm comes, they, the cattle start to panic. Instead of hunkering down to ride the things out or, or pushing through the storm, the cattle turn tail and they scatter. Of course, the storm quickly overtakes them and the result is chaos. It takes them forever to regroup. It takes them even longer to regain the ground that they just lost during the storm. And sadly, in that kind of a scenario, the herd can't protect those who need protection most. Now, when a buffalo sees a storm coming, they act like conservatives. They, instead of running helter-skelter, they turn and they face it head on. It's a difference. Initially, it's tougher going. The wind's in their face. It's stressful. It's hard. It's difficult work. 
But because they push through the storm and, he and head on like that, buffalo come out of it much sooner, they're much stronger, and the herd stays together much better than the cattle. And uh, since they do it that way, they're also the first to see any breaks in the weather, the first to take advantage of any opportunities coming out of the storm. And by acting as they do, they're certainly best positioned to protect those who need protection most. So balancing the budget is hard work, but we'll gladly take a little of that up front because we've seen firsthand how that hard work sets the stage for a prosperous future. In this election year, when the economy is top of mind for Canadians, movement conservatives need to support and communicate the relevance of conservative values and economic principles, living within our means, keeping taxes low, supporting, not opposing, wealth creation projects, expanding trade opportunities, creating the infrastructure needed to get our resources to market, improving the productivity of our capital and labour markets, and so on. And as long as we face these issues head on, even if the economic storm does hit us, we'll be able to endure it and bounce back stronger than ever. But a strong economy and the opportunities that go with it are put at risk not only by those that think that fiscal matters will look after themselves. They're also at risk if we fail to perform the most fundamental role of a modern democratic state, and that's to provide security at home and abroad for law-abiding citizens. Building a secure country at home and taking part in multilateral international efforts on security abroad are a priority for conservative supporters. And they're a priority for most Canadians, regardless whether they're conservative or not. A Leger poll uh, conducted in Quebec this month tells an interesting tale. 62% of Quebecers support the war against terrorism in Iraq. A whopping 74% of them agree with the new federal anti-terror bill. And the numbers are similar across the country. But conservatives advocated such measures before they were popular because it is the principled response when faced with threats by unprincipled people to our collective and individual security. Now, I should point out that one of those who does not support the government's action is angry Tom. Tom is very angry about this, and I'm not exactly sure why, I can't figure that out exactly, but he is, let's just say he's pretty much angry about anything the Conservatives have done, from balancing the budget to uh, legislation to block statutory release of violent offenders. He's, he's very angry about the anti-terror bill because he's just very angry. And perhaps that's why, I'm not sure, I don't want to take it personally, or, but perhaps that's why I particularly enjoyed the sessions we had this morning dealing with threats to our security at home and abroad. Weren't those good sessions? Boy, world-class <laughs> folks with world-class experience telling us what it is, you know, our first world problems here, you know, when we consider some of the things that are being said in the House. I think these folks have had to live with this, and it's, it's good to listen to those folks who have had to live it day by day. We heard from those experts dealing on religious extremism or experts on how China is advancing their own agenda in the world. Uh, and this afternoon we're going to hear from uh, our new Defense Minister Jason Kenney who will no doubt address among other things the growing threat of Russian imperialism and what it means for Europe and for Canada uh, and for the rest of the world as far as that goes. So protecting the lives and property of law-abiding citizens didn't just suddenly become popular or necessary. It was, and is, and always will be a core responsibility of responsible government. So on the major issues of the day, the state of the conservative movement's in pretty good shape, I think. Strong emphasis on the economy, strong bona fides on security and public safety, and a pattern of actions consistent with their principles and platform commitments. If you combine that with a motivated and informed uh, group of supporters, I think the stars line up uh, in elections across the country this coming year. But it's it's worth mentioning three areas where movement conservatives can do better and be more influential as they move forward. The first is in municipal governance and politics. Uh, if you attended the polling session uh, with Preston Manning, you'll have heard some of these numbers, but they're worth repeating. There are 338 elected federal MPs in the country, 760 elected officials at the provincial and territorial level, but there are 25,000 elected municipal officials. And as Conservatives, uh, we have devoted far less attention to the application of Conservative principles and values at this level than we have at the provincial and the federal levels. And as a result, many of the councils of our largest municipalities are dominated by councillors for whom wealth creation, living within their means, budget balancing and debt reduction are, to be charitable, low priorities. 
At the Manning Center, we have developed studies, training, and material to help you apply conservative values and principles to municipal politics. You can find these at manningfoundation.org. Uh, you will also see, uh, uh, we've also developed software for tracking the performance and the ideo ideological leanings of municipal councils, and these can be found at our site, councilltracker.ca. And for those who shrug their shoulders and think that we should just leave municipal outcomes to chance, I would only point out, to the, point out the recent work of the Broadbent Institute, which is working, and good for them, which is working hard and working hand in glove with the public service unions to ensure that they elect a maximum number of officials sympathetic to their cause. So this then is primarily a call to movement conservatives like you, not to the political parties themselves, because most of these uh, municipalities don't have a party structure in place, but to movement conservatives. It's important to devote more attention to and become more active in the politics and governance of the municipality in which you live. The alternative is to be governed by those who are more active in municipal politics. And I will tell you, and you must see it, that uh, too often these players do not share the conservative values and principles that we've talked about at this con conference. The second issue is the need to work together to develop what might be called, for lack of a better term, a turnaround services for conservative officials, parties, and supporters who find themselves in opposition. It's easy to forget here in Ottawa that while Canadians are currently enjoying a national conservative government, that hasn't always been the case. Right now, the federal government shares our concern for fiscal responsibility and private sector wealth creation. But conservative forces are not doing as well elsewhere in the country. They languish in opposition, sometimes for decades, while opposing views and policies and principles carry the day. What can be done to assist conservative parties, supporters, and interest in jurisdictions where they have lost elections, where conservatives may be demoralized or less well financed or less well organized than they should be? What can be done to restore their capabilities and capacities and to attract and command public support? I think that's the right question, but what is the right response? Well, what would happen if the conservative think tanks, interest groups, and political friends in all these jurisdictions went to work over the next year to discuss and develop the tools necessary to turn things around quickly. The tools should include a package of research, training, and organizational services that might be provided to them in opposition so that the turnaround happens quickly. And just think of the difference if they would successfully return to office in the next election instead of languishing in opposition for two or more terms, which is the current pattern. This then is the second challenge I'll leave with you. The conservative movement should put together a toolbox called turnaround services. It should include research, training, organizational services, and more. And we will put this subject on next year's Manning Networking Conference to see if we can start to chart that path forward together to help our opposition parties get back into government sooner. Now, Whatever charting we may come up with, let's not make the same mistake as the U.S. Democrats, who would have done well to listen to Virginia Postrel in our session this morning entitled Glamour and Politics. Now, I should just point out, Preston, there is no truth to the rumor that Preston Manning wanted to teach this session on glamour and politics himself. <laughs> he was going to teach a session called the Uncharismatic Charismatic. And, uh, but we wouldn't let him do it. In the U.S., when the Democrats were in opposition during the Bush years, instead of examining in depth the principles and policies of the party and to frankly address the intellectual bankruptcy and organizational weaknesses into which they had fallen, they chose a different route. It's too difficult, they said. All we need is a charismatic leader, a super communicator, and all will be well. So that's what they did. They found a communicator in Barack Obama. He, he has social, ap social appeal and a message as deep as yes we can. He's an Instagram and a selfie. And they, they sort of won. And this is what you get. Nothing says presidential like a selfie stick. <laughs> I like this one. This is the one that, that he took of himself at the funeral. Mrs. Obama is not amused. Uh, and then this, this, is, this is the interview, the green lipstick lady. Uh, this was after the State of the Union address. He didn't have tom, time to talk about the uh, $18 trillion debt and other pressing matters. But in USA Today, this is, what they, this is the quote. President Obama wrapped up a brief post-State of the Union tour Thursday with a trip into cyberspace. 
taking questions on YouTube that included queries about his favorite television show, what he wanted to be growing up, and what superpower he would like to possess. So eight years on, this is what we've been reduced to. Unable to, or they've been reduced to, unable to achieve anything substantial in terms of policy or governance. They're down in the polls, they're mired in debt, they're facing gridlock in Congress. They've lost elections in the House and in the Senate. They're judged by the international community and history as a weak administration, having campaigned on hope, yet turning out to be hopeless as a government. Glamour and charisma may occasionally win an election, but they are no guarantee of good governance and a sound administration capable of addressing the real needs and concerns of a country or its people. Now, I was asked, you know, dare you compare that failed strategy with the Liberal Party of Canada? Yes, I dare. I dare. Actually, I do dare. You know, disbelieving that a natural governing party like themselves could be sent packing, the Liberals have gone through a series of leaders chosen not for the promise to re-examine the fundamental intellectual and geographic weaknesses of that party, but they've been chosen for their supposed charisma, star quality, or glamour. In fact, the same U.S. Democrat consultants have been engaged by the Liberals to, in, to help inflict charisma without content, communications without achievement, and promises without principles upon the people of Canada. My point is this, as we develop turnaround services and turnaround strategies to restore provincial conservatives to office, that package must be characterized by honest, in-depth analysis, substantive content, and the framework and details of good government. Ian Duncan Smith reminded us yesterday that good policies are also good politics if these policies are linked to and explained in terms of conservative values and principles. To choose glamour and charisma over content and principles is to choose media and public relations fluff that blooms with promise but withers and dies under the harsh sun and winds of public scrutiny and public office. In closing, let me move from why conservatives want to govern and what they have for priorities to the how of governing. In the session Public Opinion 2015, we heard details of what voters expect of their political leaders and parties. Those details apply to public office holders of all levels, whether they be municipal or Aboriginal, provincial or federal leaders. Taking the pulse of the voters is useful to us, only if we actually pay attention to what they're actually saying, how emphatically they say it, and how we should respond to it. Although sometimes, let's face it, it's impossible to convince some of the people you're doing the right thing, doesn't really matter you know, what, you, what you say or what you do. I, what's that old expression, if, uh, if Prime Minister Harper walked on water, the Toronto Star would say, you know, Harper can't even swim. You know, that, we know that. I, I, when I was minister, uh, when I was still a minister, I met a constituent in my Chilliwack office, and he got the appointment because he said he wanted to talk about federal banking. And since it's, since it's a federal regulated uh, industry, uh, it, that's the reason for the meeting. So I took the meeting. And it didn't take me long to figure out this guy didn't really want to talk about banking at all. What he wanted to convince me of is that there's a plan afoot to move us all into one common North American currency. And that was a big worry. Well, I listened for a little while, and I finally st I just stopped him. And I said, uh, listen, sir, there's no plan to take away the Canadian dollar. He, he, I should, he may be related to Maud Barlow, I don't know, but he, he, anyway, that's the way he was coming across. I, saw the, I sit at the cabinet table, there's been no discussions about taking away the Canadian dollar. Uh, I told him we met with the governor of the Bank of Canada uh, from time to time, and he'd never brought up the idea of one common currency. Uh, it wasn't being recommended by any think tanks. I said, it's never been raised on the floor of the House of Commons. Uh, sir, I said, it's, it's just not going to happen. There is no plan to move to one common currency in North America. And he looked at me for a minute and said, it's worse than I thought. Even you don't know about it. <laughs> so, you know, for some people, it will never matter what you say, what you do. We know that. But thankfully, most Canadians aren't like that. And in our annu annual survey, we asked Canadians what does matter to them. We asked them if it mattered that their politicians be knowledgeable about key issues such as the economy or health care and, and the environment. We asked how important it was that their politicians possess certain essential skills, such as the ability to legislate or to communicate or to listen. And finally, how important was it that their politicians possess sound character, shown in attributes like honesty, integrity, trustworthiness, and a commitment to the service of others? 
each of these three skills, each of these three, knowledge, skills, and character, are important, which is why at the Manning Center in our School of Practical Politics, we put emphasis on all three. They're all important. But the survey shows clearly that Canadians support candidates, first and foremost, who are of good character. To the voter, a candidate of good character trumps one that is simply knowledgeable. Good character easily beats out the importance of one's ideological position. Character matters more than their skill level. Good character, exemplified by traits like honesty, integrity, trustworthiness, and a commitment to put the interests of others ahead of your own, are more important to the voters than anything else. So how you conduct yourselves, how we conduct ourselves, not just why we seek public office or the policies we champion or discuss here at this conference, but how you conduct yourself reveals something important to the voters, to their family, friends and associates, especially over the long haul. This is the third challenge, especially uh, now, I think, nowadays, given the poll results we saw uh, yesterday. It's something to consider for current elected officials and those potentially seeking public office. Voters will pick up on your character, not because you fulfill the minimum requirements of the ethics commissioner or the chief electoral officer, but because you've proven that you'll do the right thing for the right reasons through thick and thin, time and again, whether you're under pressure or not. That is good character and we should promote it. So, character development starts in the cradle, so it's not easy for an organization like this or for a meeting like this or for university profs, or for interest groups, or think tanks, or political parties to develop that good character later in life. But what we can do, and what we should do, is recognize how important character is to the voters. And we should do everything in our power to ensure that the volunteers, the constituency executives, the thinkers, the activists, the spokespersons, the campaigners, and the candidates we offer up to the public under a conservative banner are, above all, people of character. So in today's um, MNC program, this session is entitled The State of the Conservative Movement. And it's an honor for me to be asked by Preston Manning to say a few words at this time. But really, this entire conference has been about addressing the state of the movement, one topic after another. The ideas and issues we've uh, heard discussed from the podium the past couple of days have come from thoughtful people. And in turn, I trust you've been having thoughtful conversations about them and their, and their ideas in small groups or over lunch and discussing whether or how you can put some of these ideas into practice or how you can share them with other Canadians as we all plan a path forward together. I've been encouraged, as I'm sure you have been, to hear our federal and provincial government leaders champion a principled response on the issues of job and the jobs in the economy. Canadians understand its importance and they expect sound fiscal management from those in charge. It's been reassuring to see that there are elected officials who didn't just suddenly discover the concept of providing security at home and abroad. They've campaigned on it for years and they continue to put it front and center. I'm hopeful as well that we'll all spend some time going forward considering how we might put together that toolbox of ideas and services so that conservatives in opposition might turn things around more quickly as well as engaging more effectively at the municipal level. And let's also continue to encourage elected officials and one another to develop and practice the values, integrity, and principles that are the hallmark of good character. And I think that the more we focus on these things, the more we'll be able to move forward together, the more we'll be able to say that the state of the conservative movement is in good shape, and the more likely we'll be able to gather together a year from now to prou proudly say that we're gonna call the next chapter of our country's history, the true North, strong and free. Thank you very much.